My name is Josh Miller. I own Riverstone Kennels, and I've been training gun dogs for more than 16 years. I have field trialed, I've hunt tested, but at the end of the day, I'm a duck hunter. You might find that the duck in our Duck Dogs podcast is spelt uniquely. The UK stands for my British labs. I love my British labs. I love what they offer me, both as a part of my family and the high motor in the field. As you're going to find, I have some pretty special dogs. Follow along in our podcast series here as we talk about both in the field hunting and in the field training situations that will hopefully help you progress with your dog at home. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Duck Dogs. I'm Josh Miller, and uh, I'm joined today by my lovely bride, Whitney. And uh, don't talk yet, though. <laughs> I was going to, actually. I know you were. I could see it in your face. <laughs> um, I have to first thank our sponsors because they make that show or this show possible. Um, thank you to... God, this is going to be a mess of a show <laughs> if you're going to be laughing at me the whole time. Thank you to Yukonuba. Yukonuba is our premium uh, presenting sponsor. Yukonuba Premium Performance Sport 3020 is what we currently have all of our dogs on as we're in the heat of training season, uh, both literally and fit figuratively here uh, in Wisconsin, heat of the weather and heat of the mid uh, part of the season. Uh, but the, the Yukonuba Premium Performance Sport 3020 has allowed our dogs to perform at their peak uh physical condition, and also recover uh, great coats, great energy levels across the board, www.yukanuba.com. Thank you to Lucky Duck. Lucky Duck is your five-star crash test-ready kennel, both in the intermediate and in the large size. So no matter how big or small your hunting partner is, you can be sure they're traveling the safest way possible, www.luckyduck.com. Also, thank you to Sitka Gear. Sitka Gear is your premium option for outdoor clothing, not just during hunting season, but also during training season as they have a number of items that will keep you in the field and more comfortable longer, even in your training season. Uh, so go check out www.sitkagear.com. Thank you to Gundog Supply. Gundog Supply is your one-stop shop for all of your hunting and training needs as it pertains to your four-legged hunting partner. Be sure to go check them out, you guys. They they have done a fantastic job supporting us and this this podcast. Uh, we actually just uh, found out the winner of episode 103 and the giveaway that uh, that they did with uh, 103. I'll, I'll kind of fill you guys in on that stuff here a little later. Um, but they're just a fantastic company. They do, they do great stuff for us and supporting our community. So go check them out. Great customer service, great products, www.gundogsupply.com. Thank you to Kent Cartridge. Kent Cartridge is not only our, our option and our go-to for shotgun shells in the field, but also when we need blanks, they're really one of the few companies that even do it you know, anymore. So uh, Kent Cartridge, if you guys are looking for blanks in your training season, uh, blanks would be they're simulating that 12-gauge round, but there's not the danger of the actual shot being projected. So uh, uh, Kent Cartridge, go check out the, uh, the field blanks. They're a great product. Last but not least, thank you to Retriever Roadmap. Retriever Roadmap is your premium option for online training, so training your own dog at home. And for being a listener of this podcast, you can use the code DD for duck dogs, DD100, and you will get $100 off your membership uh, getting into that program. And it is training season, you guys. So if you guys are finding that you're stuck, that you're going through the motions, that you're just not making progress, go check out that program because I cannot tell you how many success stories and how much positive feedback we've been getting from people training on their own, you know, hitting milestones, getting over you know, hurdles and road bumps. The community has been fantastic. We have a big uh, strike force meeting coming up. Uh, the strike teams have been great. Y you owe it to yourself. Go check that out. So also, w yep. oh, okay, ahead. one thing. Also, it's I not. Did, I did say not to talk until no, I was I know, but hang on one second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this tr retriever roadmap also has great videos for bringing home a puppy. Mm. So if you are bringing home a puppy this summer or fall or winter, you can sign up and learn a lot of things about what to do when you bring your puppy home. Mm. Leave it to the puppy queen <laughs> to think about puppies. Of course. Good job. Um, so www.retrieverroadmap.com. And again, use the code DD100 
one zero zero DD one hundred, and it will get you a hundred dollars off that membership. So, all right, you guys. So, um, as as you've now heard her lovely voice, <laughs> Whitney uh, is with us here today. Uh, Whitney, what have you been up to? Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm yeah? going to cut you off. Gosh, I'm sorry. That oh was that gosh. was rude. But I, I just I, I owe the I owe everyone an apology before mm. you get going. Okay, okay. My apology is, you guys, that I think I have been like two weeks incognito here and uh, not intentionally so. We are just in a very thick of it time uh, at the kennel and it uh, it's, it's really unfortunate, but there's just so many hours in the day. And so to kind of give you guys an idea, uh, I have been uh, I've been getting up extremely early. We've been starting at sun up uh, just to get uh, get going and get these dogs trained in the cool weather. And then, you know, because it's been hot, you know, we went mm-hmm. from in, in Wisconsin, we went from what it felt like was spring, you know, like 60, 65 to 90. <laughs> and it was, it was, we were getting affected by it. Mm-hmm. The dogs have been getting affected by it. And, you know, we need to be, you know, training that cool weather. So we start very early. And we're also in that time where that first intermediate class is going to be going home here in about three weeks. And we have more and more clients that are traveling in to spend time with us to learn how to train and learn how to handle their dog. And as you can imagine, when people come from like this last week, we've had uh, people come from Washington, from Texas, from Atlanta, Atlanta, from Connecticut. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, as you can imagine, like that's not a one hour appointment, right? Like I'm spending half the day, you know, with, with these people in most cases. And when half the day gets gone, you know, and t- you take four hours out of that day, it just really eats up. Um, sorry, Ricky mistake, not muting my computer. <laughs> um, it just really eats up that time. And uh, so not saying that I'm not trying to make this a priority. I just, it's really difficult you know, to manage with that. And the one thing that I do feel like my wife will be able to confirm or deny this. So I'm a little nervous about this. Uh, but I do feel like I've done a really, really good job this year committing to being a dad. Oh, for sure. Like yep. at four o'clock when our kids get home, mm-hmm. I've been doing a really good job. Now I've been working late after mm-hmm. they go to bed. Um, but while they're home from that four to eight thirty, when they get yep. to, to, well, eight thirty is when they go to bed. <laughs> our son likes to push that envelope <laughs> as hard as he can. Um, but I, I feel like I've been really dedicated to being a dad in yeah. that time, especially because I don't get that time in the mornings because we're training so much in the, in the morning. So you guys can see where I'm going with this. It's not I'm, I'm not trying to neglect this. I'm not trying to not prioritize this. Um, but that's that's the why you know, behind why I've been behind on this. So uh, hopefully we're kind of you know weathering through this a little bit. I'll be able to be more consistent. But I did owe you guys that apology before Whitney gets going. I think that's great. That's very nice of you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so what have you been up to it? Um, I have been caring for so many puppies. It's been puppy season like no other. I just counted and I've had 11 litters so far this year. Um, it's been so fun. A lot of new litters, um, new females in the breeding program. Um, and a lot of big litters, a lot of litters of between nine to 12, which is, you know, typical. I would say last year was seven to nine. And this year it's been more nine to 12. So been really busy with, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of puppies. It's been so fun because we've had so many different litters, meeting so many new people, seeing so many previous clients, getting another puppy from us and meeting, um, all of those people when they come pick up their puppy. So puppies, 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 puppies. So I want you to dig into this a little bit because I feel like sometimes people go, well, gosh, it's June. If you've already had 11 litters this year, like, holy cow, like what I don't want, and this is always, um, there's so much perception Mm -hmm. that goes into the the puppy mill. Totally. Yeah. Term. Right. And, um, you know, so dig into. How into I the, juggle it? You, well, not only juggle it, like <clears throat> what, the, the why. Okay. Why have you had 11 litters mm-hmm. already this year? And what is the back half of your year look okay, like? Okay, totally. Okay, so when you have, I mean, I did not have all those litters all at the same time. So you think about it, they're spread out. Um, but we have incredible employees. And so my, I have college girls coming back. I have high school girls. They take care of all of my daily chores for me. So they are cleaning the puppy pens. They'll walk my mom as if I need them to. They do um, a lot of behind the scenes stuff so I can stay up front 
and continue my communication, continue um, like the vet care that I have to with the litters and the mamas. And I'm really, they're hands on, but they're hands on to help take stress off of me that I don't need to 100% be hands on. So um, it's actually a great example because I had my Wisconsin state inspection last week mm-hmm. and he was here at literally like I was in the fire of it, right? Like, and he left and he was like, Whitney, if anyone ever came to me wondering who I would recommend as a breeder, it would be you. And that was like the Huge biggest compliment. I mean, he's, he inspects the entire state. And for him to say that when I was in the ring of it, because he's like, your mamas are so happy. They look so healthy. Your puppies are healthy. Your, your well-being room is so clean. Your puppy nurseries are so clean. And he's like, you know, like what a huge compliment because I work so hard to strive for that perfection. And for someone that sees so many different breeders Mm -hmm. and knows different breeders and sees what I have going on versus everyone else, like what a huge compliment when I am in that thick of the time. Mm -hmm. Well, and I want to add on to that, that state inspection side of it, because I didn't plan on talking about this, but now that you, you open it up, I'm sure there'd be a question here from somebody out there of like, state inspection like what are you talking about Mm -hmm. so we get inspected by the state is and it's through akc correct no this is the state state of wisconsin okay so they have an inspector that comes out and inspects our facilities inspects Mm -hmm. our dogs inspects the database paperwork literally everything everything you can think of it's really really intensive Mm -hmm. and um so him leaving saying that Mm -hmm is extremely high praise. Mm-hmm. And so kudos to you, because that's, that's not me, <laughs> that's you doing that. Yeah. Um, but here, here's you know, some of the things we have to deal with with that. So um, one, they come completely random. Mm-hmm. So we're in the middle of training season. We're in the middle of Whitney's you know, crazy breeding season. We're in the middle of everything. We have clients in, all this mm-hmm. stuff. And boom, state inspector shows up. <laughs> and how, like, we have to juggle that. That, that to me... I understand why it has to be random. Yeah. Because someone could fabricate it. I get it. But it is so frustrating. Because, I mean, like, it's, to me, like, we had clients there that all of a sudden we couldn't give our undivided attention to Mm -hmm. because of it. A little frustrating, but it is what it is, right? Um, To give you guys an idea, and most of you guys will laugh at this. um, I hope so, anyway. Um, So we got knocked for not having toys in with our dogs. Mm-hmm. Not having toys in <laughs> with our dogs in the kennel runs. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, my question, of course, is like, come on, man. Like, you're, you're telling us we're, we're you know, exceptional in everything, and then you're going to knock us on this? I was like, there's no way I'm going to have toys in with these dogs to where they could choke. Where they could have, I mean, there's stuff that could go mm-hmm. on, and I'm not over, you know, I'm not looking over the kennel run all the time. And... um you know, he was like, well, you know, he's, he's like, I get it, but this is part of, part of, you know, my job. Yeah. And I, so, and I understand that, but you know, my response and you know, I'm just of course kind of playing a little bit of devil's advocate. Right. But I'm like, man, like the reason you're here is because we're doing this right. Mm-hmm. Right. Like I could probably name five kennels in this County that aren't legal, that aren't doing things the proper way, that don't have the proper association, that don't have the proper licensing, that don't, you don't even, you don't go check them. Because they're not legal, but we're doing it right. And then mm-hmm. we get nitpicked on this kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, it's so frustrating, but, yeah. but they have to have, but they have something to. across the line for everyone. I get it. I get yeah. it. But it is a little <laughs> frustrating, you know, from that, from that side of it. But, yeah. um, but great experience overall oh, yeah, Great. where I was going with the litter thing. Okay. So mm-hmm. how we do the litters, if, mm-hmm. if you haven't heard us talk about this before is when you get a puppy from us, it is a limited registration, meaning that you cannot go breed this puppy, okay? Mm-hmm. Sometimes people, you know, question it, so I'm just going to put it out there right now, okay? What goes into building the line that we have built <laughs> between years, years and years and years of hard work, numerous trips overseas, finding the right dogs, weeding the wrong dogs out, building the relationships, the investments I just booked a plane ticket for, you know, to go overseas again. Like this, it is an extreme financial and time commitment to do all this. And then even if you do all that, if you don't do it in the right manner, you're still not going to have the relationships. You're still not going to get the right dogs. You're still not going to have the lines that you're wanting. So why would I give that away 
for you just purchasing a puppy, right? Like, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't make sense. Two, like, I'm very proud of what we have built. I'm not going to give someone the opportunity to potentially damage the name of what we've done because they get a puppy. This puppy has Riverstone associated with it because it's a Riverstone puppy, and they decide to breed it with the neighbor's half lab, half whatever, yeah. and because they're, that's a good dog too, and they're just going to have puppies, and now whoever gets those puppies are like, well, what the heck? Well, let's look in the lines. Oh, it's, it's Riverstone. Like, what mm-hmm. in the world? What are they doing, right? No, we're going to control that. Yeah. And so that's that's part of, of that. But in that, how we handle the breeding program is that if you have a female, if you get a female from us, that we, if we think that the dog fits our standard, we'll invite that dog back to be a part of the breeding program, which breeders that are out there listening, it's the best way to do this thing. Mm-hmm. Because if you own the girls, really, my opinion you should only be breeding them two, maybe three times. Like, mm-hmm. don't be breeding these dogs six, no. seven, eight times. Are you kidding me? Yeah. That is hard on them. So breed them two, maybe three times if everything goes perfect, right? But they have a forever home, mm-hmm. right? Otherwise, you have a four or five-year-old dog. Now what? Now what do you do with that girl, mm-hmm. right? I get the other side of it that, while well, you can get semen from anywhere in the world. I, I, I get that. But that's not my thought process. My thought process is I want to know the boy that I'm using. I mean, I want to train him. I want to know his strengths and weaknesses, what his pros and cons are, what he developed like, what his strength, well, like, yeah, and then match that, mm-hmm. right? When we have our lines, we can do that. So we keep everything very in-house. Now, where I'm going with this as far as the 11 litters that yeah, you've had yeah, you know, yeah. this year already, okay? What happens is when someone is, you know, we invite them into the breeding program, you know, they're, they're going to do a litter, right? Nine times out of 10, probably more than that, that owner is a hunter. Yeah. That girl is a hunting dog. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So do you really think that guy wants the girl gone during hunting season? Right. Right, during that right. fall cycle? Yeah, because right? it's every six months that they come into heat. Right, so mm-hmm. they would prefer to have that spring litter yep. because then they can still have the dog in the fall. Totally get it. But what happens for wit mm-hmm. is that springtime stacks way up because of it. Yep. Naturally. Right. Yeah. And, and of course, we're trying to do what we can for the owner because this is a two way street. Right. We're winning. They're winning, you know, in, in a number of ways that I for privacy reasons, I won't share here, mm-hmm. but they're winning on this as well. And uh, but we want to make it to where like I, I don't want to take a hunting season away from somebody you know, if we can help. So yeah. that now the back half of your year is looking like hunting season galore <laughs> i'm so excited there you go because i don't have to have i mean i'll probably have one two litters this fall and winter mm-hmm. but because we've had such a busy spring i owe it to myself and i don't need to have all those puppies you know this fall winter and let everyone enjoy their hunting dog and just finally get back to my big passion right Right. And, and I think that's important because I think if people have been following along with your spring, mm-hmm. you know, they're probably going like, geez, they're having 50 <laughs> litters this year. You know, not the case, you guys. No, not, not the definitely case. not. Um, but I will say that it has been nothing short of incredible watching Whitney do what she has done, how she has handled it, how she's managed it, how she's juggled it, the mental side of her staying engaged and handling <laughs> this the way that she's handled it. And most importantly, being a mom on top of it all. It's been nothing short of incredibly impressive. And and this, this is one of these things that not many people, I, I just really believe this, not many mm-hmm. people could do that. You know, when you think about the, the the dynamic of what you've been doing with not only, you know, whelping these puppies, and of course they never come on 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, right? It's always over. 10 o'clock night, on a Tuesday night. <laughs> right, all night. And then guess what? You don't get to go to bed because you still right. have to be happy when the kids get up and you have to be mom, right? Mm-hmm. And then the day starts. Well, you have people that are expecting you that you're working during the work day, so you're mm-hmm. working, and then you're mom again, and then finally, four eight hours later, you get to bed, right? Yeah. It's 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 really an incredible thing, and um, and I just want everyone to know, and I want you to know that mm-hmm. I'm I'm extremely thankful. There are just very few people that have your work ethic. Thank you. And, and I think that's a really incredible thing to watch when I hear people talk about how hard like how hard it is to be a mom. I get it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, like the like, it's not easy being a mom. I totally get that. But to be a mom and do what you've done, like, and how you do it, it's pretty awesome. Thank you. So, thank you. Um, thank you. So, uh, we 
have to be out of here in roughly another hour yeah. um, because you have puppy pickups. Puppy pickups. So you have to get uh, get back to the office and yeah. um, get ready. So I want to dig into something. So before I get into that, um, mm -hmm. did um, I, I want to I want to dig into quick one quick little story, and that quick little story is um, if you guys have followed along in the episodes, you heard a while back uh, my my uh, Waffle House uh, story. If you have not, I wish I knew what episode that was. Long story short, um, I just had kind of a, a moment, a meaningful moment for me uh, in a Waffle House in St. Louis where I just bought everybody's meals. And uh, that story, there's more to that story, but that's the gist of it. Um, the, that's not, there's way more impact than that, but go listen to that. Um, then we had uh, one of our, our listeners tell me that that moved them so much that they sent me a hundred dollar bill and I was then able to uh, to pass that on in uh, in a, a story which was great um, and then now I've had number another one so I had Scott uh, Ferguson send me a, uh, a hundred dollar bill and say hey you know you and uh, Rick moved me so much with what you guys are doing I, I want in on this too. And he sent me a hundred dollar bill. So I'll tell you guys, uh, what happened with, uh, with Scott's hundred dollars. So, uh, I was actually, I don't, I have not told you this story. No, yet. I was literally like, what? Yeah. Um, so I, I keep, I keep that hundred dollars in my wallet and, um, especially cause the last, the last couple have kind of just presented themselves. I was like, gosh, like, like I gotta, I gotta do it. Like I'm looking for it all the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, it's just going to happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So, this was probably three weeks ago or so. And cause you were, you, this was in your busy time mm -hmm. of, of puppies. And I drove through Culver's in new Richmond here. Mm -hmm. I drove through Culver's to get us dinner and I was just driving through. It was wicked hot. And it was one of these first hot days that we had. Right. Mm -hmm. So like everybody's dying. It's just like <laughs> we in the North, like we're, we pray for this weather. <laughs> and then once it's here, we're all like, Oh, it's so it's terrible. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I'm, I, I ordered and I drove up and I'm just watching. So if you've ever been to a Culver's, you order, you drive up, you wait and like the employees kind of shuffle food out. And this, um, I, I was watching these people like drag out, drag out, like you, you just telling their faces, you know, mm -hmm. like it was like, they didn't want to go back outside. And then there was one guy, he was a heavier set guy and, uh, he was just happy. Mm -hmm. like smiling, like every car he went by, Hey, how's it going? How's it going? Like infectious. Mm -hmm. Right. And I watched this happen. I watched him go back and forth. And, um, he, he came up and, uh, when it was time for my food, he was the one that delivered my food. Right. So he comes up, he's like, Hey man, how's it going? I'm like, I'm great, man. How are you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm fantastic, man. It's a beautiful yeah. day and all stuff. And I was like, great. So he hands me my food and I was like, Hey, you know, the kids, the kids get a, uh, little one scoop. Sunday, which of course our kids just like die over. Like they just, that's the highlight. Um, and I was like, I think the kids meals were supposed to come with us. He's like, Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, man. I, that, they didn't put that in there. Let me go grab it before I'll be right back. And he literally like, like sped walk, you know, back. And, uh, what, what the one thing I missed in that is when I told him, I was like, I was like, how are you? Yeah, I'm great. How are you doing? He's like, he's like, man, the only thing that, that would make this better is if I could cut these pants into shorts. And, be, and <laughs> that was, that was what he said. And uh, so when he shuffled off, I'm like, there you go. That's it. Uh -huh. So he came back, handed me the two Sundays and I, I was like, Hey man, I want you to have this, you know? And he like, Aww. like ghost white. Like it was, it was pretty cool. Um, and he's like, what? <laughs> he, you know, I'm just like, <laughs> like, completely flabbergasted. I'm like, man, mm -hmm. like, you know, go get yourself a pair of shorts. Oh, and, uh, and he awesome. like literally like tears in his eyes and everything. And I just like, and I told him before I left, I was like, man, like your, your attitude mm -hmm. is infectious. Don't ever change. Oh, and I drove awesome. off and he literally, I, I looked in my mirrors. I was going like, he was literally like standing there like, oh. like stone cold. So Scott, oh you, uh, you, I, I'm not an emotional person, but I, I, know, I get tears in my eyes talking about this. Like, I don't I know. know. It's, it's amazing. just, yeah. Um, so Scott, you made uh, you made somebody's day, man. Like that was that was fantastic. So um, so thank mm -hmm. you guys. You know, Rick was the first one. Scott now uh, the second one. If anyone else you know, wants, to, I, this is not a call to action at all. But mm -mm. this has been a pretty special thing. Mm -hmm. It's been really neat to uh, to be a part of this, and all because of 
you know, that one story. You know, mm-hmm. Pretty cool. So, That's awesome. Um, so anyway, um, Q&A. So Whitney took it upon herself yesterday to mm-hmm. put on the Riverstone story that we're going to be doing a podcast and wanted some questions. So we're going to go through some questions. And Whit, here's how I think we do this. Because okay. we have, I don't know if you've looked at it, if you yeah, pull your phone it's up. A, it's a good it's, it's a lot. <laughs> like, it is a lot of questions, which is fantastic. Here's what I think we do. Let's kind of just kind of pick and choose, you know, because I don't want to go in order because there's quite a few people here that sent in maybe two or three questions. So mm-hmm. I'm trying to spread the okay. love best I can. So why don't we do this? Okay. Maybe just, like, scroll through and just, like, whatever catches your eye. Yeah. You pick one, then I pick one. You okay. pick one, I pick one. Let's just kind of, you know, pick through this. But uh, thank you guys for everyone that did send in questions yeah. because this is fantastic. It's so fun. But. Okay, are you going to go first or you want me to? You. Oh, you want me to? Okay. first. Okay. Um... Let's go with. Well, you're looking what? at this. I want to. Yeah. I want to talk about a pet peeve. Oh, okay. Th- this is. I, this is going to be like a 30 second soapbox. <laughs> but like, I, I have a major pet peeve that I've seen more and more of people that that use email like text messages. <laughs> like who emails <laughs> K? First off, if you text me K, I immediately oh, like want to letter K. I, I immediately want to throw punch you. Oh, like, like I, I'm Good sorry. Word. So full disclosure for anyone that, that, that texts me, <laughs> if you text me K, it immediately infuriates me because I think it's the absolute laziest thing you can do. I like, it just, it takes like, to me, it's like, I don't care that that's what you're telling me. I don't care. Right. Really? Like yeah. to me, like if I were to, do, I mean the same thing. Okay. Right. But I'll say, sounds good. Yeah. Is okay. 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 Great. Like, or. Okay is, okay is at least acceptable to me because it's an actual legitimate word. You better go above and beyond when texting Josh, okay? He needs emojis and everything. No, else. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, don't be lazy, you know? And now I feel like we have, through social media, yeah, we have now conditioned ourselves that any form of communication can be at that lazy level, okay? So, mm-hmm. like... When you send us an email, like this is something I've dealt with now, um, specifically through the kennel of people like inquiring about different stuff. Like, don't send me like, like there was somebody that that was like asking about one of the dogs and was just like, size question mark. I'm like, oh yeah, what are we talking about? Right. Like, give like write an email as an email should be written. Put some effort mm-hmm. into it. Put some thought. Like, come on. Yeah. Super frustrating. Anyway, that was my that was my soapbox while you were doing this. I think the problem is that just don't text me K. My goodness. I think the problem is that social media and everything else has made everyone just feel like they know who they're talking to, right? Like nowadays you feel like you know everyone and people are a lot more comfortable these days being like that. That's a really interesting perspective because I I look at it in the moment. Yeah. I look at it as so when people um so I've had I just had somebody here this week. Um so when you send me or anybody, I believe, mm-hmm. but it might just be how my account is set up. I'm not sure. When you send me a uh, message on Instagram, mm-hmm. it goes in. If we have not messaged before, it goes into message requests, yeah. which does not alert me that there's a message. So if I go in and says, hey, you've got 16 messages and I pull it up, it doesn't show me the request folder. I have to right. actually think about going in to the request folder, pulling that up, and then looking at this completely different folder. Mm -hmm. Once we've talked, not that way, but Mm -hmm. until that. So I had somebody that wrote me a question, Mm -hmm. and then I hadn't responded in like an hour, (laughs) and was like, hello, dot, 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 with four question marks. And I'm like, (laughs) first off, like, I'm working. So And so anyway, I'm not going to get into that. But the one thing that that, where I go with that is like, why are you so entitled to think that I owe you this? Like, why do I owe you a response at all, let alone one in a extremely fast manner? But you're probably more right. Like, it's probably not meant in in the way that I'm taking it in that moment. It's probably more that people are just comfortable. And it's like, well, like, yeah. And I think about like how many people visit the kennel and they're like, oh my gosh, I feel like I already know you and I've never met you. Yeah, That's 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 where my mind goes is that people feel comfortable with us, which is awesome. Like that's how everyone feels comfortable. Um, but yeah, I mean, even like when we respond in things, like we make it like a paragraph, like a written out letter, but that's just how we think, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if I like, 
I think I might have snorted there a little while back. I know. <laughs> my allergies are still bugging that. I don't know. I like I, I've been doing it for so long now with the allergies. Yeah. Like if oh, you yeah, guys yeah. are in Minnesota, Wisconsin, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Oh, but God. the wind blows and you watch the pollen fly off the trees. My truck, which is a dark gray truck, looked yellow mm-hmm. the other morning because mm-hmm. there was so much pollen on you it. You have to disgusting. use your windshield wipers to disgusting. literally get up the pollen off. Okay, are you ready? Right. Yeah, I have I'm, a question I'm for ready. you. I'm ready. We're going to start off with a really good one here. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm just going to read it as it's written. Okay. Um, okay. Josh loves this to talk about the colors. Um, oh gosh. Fox go. red Labradors for waterfall hunting and would you breed them? Thanks. <laughs> okay. So, um, if you've heard me talk about the Fox red, um, in the past, you, you know, my thoughts on this, um, but I'm going to clarify this a little bit because mm-hmm. I feel like, um, I feel like I've been maybe a little too blunt on this. Okay, so I'm going to start this off by saying we have Bracken. Yep. We have Luna. Yeah. That are both what you would call, like when you say fox bread, that's exactly what, what they are. That, mm-hmm. That's what you are defining as who they are. They're very dark red, gorgeous, yeah. beautiful. Love them. Love them to death. Love the color. Yeah. I really do. Um, my issue with fox red is that I believe – that too many people are breeding specifically for that color. Mm -hmm. And when you breed specifically for color, naturally, other things are going to go out the window, whether that's trainability, whether that's talent level, whether that's um, uh, temperament, whether that's health, whether that's, I mean, we could go right down the line, right? Something is going to suffer if you are just going for color, okay? We could talk about, the silvers and all that. I, I don't want to get down that road, right? Yeah. But yeah, yeah. when you breed specifically for color, other things are going to go out the window. Now, I, with that being said, I really don't have a problem with if somebody says fox red to describe a the shade of yellow that a dog is. I mm-hmm. really don't. No, because then you know what, like you, everyone can envision fox red. 100%. But I think we should also be clear that it is not its own color, right? right? Like it's not like chocolate. Mm-hmm. It's not, a, it's, you know, we have black, yellow, chocolate. That's it, right? So fox red is not its own color. It is yellow. It is a dark shade of yellow. It's a beautiful shade of yellow, but it's a yellow lab, mm-hmm. right? Now, when we use Bracken or when we use Luna, mm-hmm. right, if we get puppies, if we if we do everything else, right, So so temperament, Talent, trainability, natural mouth, natural retrieve, and I could go out on all my checklists. Like, brrr, they fit everything. We match her with the right you know, male. That's mm-hmm. the right combination. Boom. Like, we could have forced Luna and Bracken together, which yeah. we didn't do. <laughs> no. Right? Um, I wanted to be sure about that. After I said it, I was like, I don't think we brought them together. No. Um, if we just were going for color, we probably would have. Right? Yeah. But we weren't. Right. 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 So we match her. Yeah. With the right male to mm-hmm. get the best puppies that we possibly can, right? Yep. And then if we get puppies that are that color, fantastic. Yeah. If right. we don't, fantastic. Yeah. We have produced what we believe the best puppies we possibly could for this litter, right? Absolutely. So so would I breed them? For sure. In that sense. I would not be breeding them just for color. Mm-hmm. Um for waterfall hunting, absolutely. I mean Oh, yeah. You know, Luna, um, who is one of the girls we brought in from overseas, uh, we have placed her in her forever home. She is going to be a part of our breeding program. She's mm-hmm. with a fantastic guy. I'm really happy. Oh, my um, gosh. Me, too. It makes the, my the, heart so happy. Yeah, it's just a fantastic situation. Um, but, uh, like, she's going to be a waterfall dog. Like, Bracken's mm-hmm. a waterfall dog, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we have uh, – so, for waterfalling, for sure. I mean, that the color doesn't doesn't sway me at all there. Right. That's kind of just my thoughts on, on the – the fox red. Yeah. Side when of things. you can get fox red, dark yellow, and not even breed two dark yellows. For sure. You go back in the lineage and they just come out that color. Right. You know, like Copper Birch Patty is really dark. His mm. puppies have come through, you know, puppies from his offsprings that we have have come through that color. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and where I, I, I guess where I say that maybe I've been a little blunt on it is because um, I feel like I, I would. I drew a line in the sand mm-hmm. a while back. And the reason was it was to make the point. Like, I, I just wanted people to stop with the whole, you know, like 
like advertising fox red puppies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's why you bred that litter, like, come on, like, there's no way. There's no way that's the, to me, you know, I'm generalizing here. So someone's you know going to hate mail me. It's, it's fine. But <laughs> it's uh, generally speaking, right? There's no way that that's the best litter you could have come up with, right? If that's all, if that was your priority, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. my point on it was to not make that the priority. Yeah. Right. And I think some people kind of took it a little too far of like, you know, like I, I saw some notes on like social media of like, like there's no such thing as Fox Red. They're like, well, like, okay, let's back up a half second. There is such thing as Fox Red. If you're using that to describe the shade of yellow that a dog is. But mm -hmm. again, my clarity point was don't think that this is its own color. Yeah. Don't think this is, this is its own breed. Don't think that this is anything special. This is a yellow lab. Mm -hmm. Just like, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, I haven't heard a term that has been like generally frequently used for the lighter dogs, right? But yeah. we have a bunch of, I, I'm telling you guys, these light yellowed labs, <laughs> man, it, you go to a test, those light yellows are starting to stand out. Mm -hmm. because they're, especially if they're flashy and they're stylish and they're good looking and they're doing the work, th they're catching more and more eyes now because I think so many people went to that darker yellow. Like so for many people sure. loved that dark yellow for a long time. Not saying that they still don't, mm -hmm. but I'm telling you these light yellows are starting to stand out. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that's my, okay. My that was a great answer. That. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I think you did a great job. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So I have one here for you. Okay. Is it hard for you to say goodbye to all of your puppies when they mm -hmm. go to their homes? I think that's a great question. It's a great question. And I get asked this a lot and it's, um, to be 100% honest, no, because, okay. So people have been on our reservation list. People have been so dedicated to this puppy for a year and a half, like, I've been so dedicated to handing this puppy over for a year and a half, two years, however long they've been on the list that I've put my heart, soul, blood, and tears into making this puppy possible to hand over to this family who has been patiently waiting, so excited to get this puppy that it's almost more of like, I am so excited for puppy pickup days because the time has finally come that you and I have planned for with importing dogs, mm -hmm. making sure it's the right breeding mm -hmm. for this family, making sure it's the right puppy in that litter for this family, that there's so much like gratitude that I feel making this family so, so happy handing over that puppy. And then it does never stop there. I get so many text message updates, email updates, phone call updates. They come back for training. I mean, like this is not just a, here's your puppy. Good luck. Like this, you know, we've known each other for year and a half, two years. And that is just the beginning. We hopefully have 13 more years mm -hmm. and then you get another puppy. And like, now we have this forever relationship with this family through this one puppy that we've all been waiting mm -hmm. for. So, um, it's not because there, it's such an exciting time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and, and I'll add to that, I guess, um, a little bit on the training side too, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, these, these training dogs, it, it sounds sappy. I get it. But you know, when they're with us for three to four months, they become an incredible part of my life, of Dave's life mm -hmm. for that time. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about how much time we're spending with them every day. Mm -hmm. Right. And then for them to go home, like it does feel a little empty, especially when you get a couple that you just really love. Yeah. And then they're gone. It's like, Oh, you get to the kennel. It's like, Oh, this is different. Yeah. You know, Even our not... chore girls are like that. Oh, they will sure. have, literally have dogs come back in and they're like, Oh my gosh, so-and-so is back. I'm so excited. Like we yeah. all really get so attached to them. Yeah. But here's what I'll say about it is that I, I don't get sad when they're going home for two big reasons. One is that like what Whitney said, we do our vetting of puppy clients before they get on the list. Right. Mm -hmm. So if they're not right for us, they're not right for us. Mm -hmm. And we, if I'm trying to say this in a nice way, but I'm just going to be blunt. Like if we don't feel like you're a good person or <laughs> a good environment or a good fit, you're not getting a puppy from us. Yeah. Just the way it is. And uh, so in that case, we really feel like we have fantastic people that are coming to pick up these yeah. puppies and going to give these puppies a great life. To me, that's one of the reasons I don't get sentimental really mm -hmm. about the puppy side of it. And you watch people's faces light up. Oh, you're yeah. making their day. You're making a big impact in that, that family's life. Yeah. It, it to me, that's one of the reasons. But the mm -hmm. second thing for me is, although it's about the dogs, that's why we're here. That's why we do what we do. 
That's what we love. It's more about the people when it really comes down to it. Like these lifelong relationships and lifelong friendships that I have gotten to have because of the dogs, like one that comes up, Greg Zagorski. Yeah. All right. So Greg um, and his wife, Leanne, came up and dropped their dog off, uh, Ember, who's a solo puppy. Mm-hmm. And man, like they, they, you know, stayed overnight and we went to dinner and we did mm-hmm. like, that was all because of Blaze, their first dog that they got and yeah. the training that Blaze went through and the relationship that Greg and I got to build through that. That's why. And Greg and I text all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, I mean, like stuff like that to me, um, where I'm going and I, the, I know this a little more just cause it's, it's not fun to talk about, but when blaze is gone, Greg and I are still going to have that friendship. Yeah. Right. And, and then there'll be, you know, Ember coming up and there'll be a new puppy and there'll be, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So, um, it's about the people. Totally. To me. Yeah. So. Um, one piggyback question that I have recently gotten a lot is, do your kids have a hard time when the puppies go home? Because I, I feel like I've shown our kids a lot with the puppies because the puppies are well socialized with kids yep. um, before they go home. And it was so interesting to me because it hit me that our kids don't know any different. Yeah, they it, they're know, kind of farm kids that way. Yeah, it's so interesting because I was like, actually, they don't have a hard time when the puppies go home, but it's more adult dogs. When we import the adult dogs, they're in our home, and then we have to say goodbye to the adult dogs. So mm-hmm. our kids are like totally flip-flopped on what like a normal household is with puppies. Yeah, and so here's the, the deal that we're dealing with right now. Okay, so I have um, my rope horse named Willie. <laughs> if you follow me on social media, you've seen Willie. Um, you know, I put a lot of time in, into Willie. Um, he He's become a really, really nice rope horse. Um, if you guys don't know, if maybe it's your first time listening, I, I tie down rope. Um, he's a cowboy. Yeah, <laughs> I try to be, trying to live a childhood dream. <laughs> anyway, um, our son, Colt, is infatuated with Willie, loves him, like to the point that uh, they did a, a class project of like, you know, who's your best friend? It's Willie. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Because, and the reason I say, oh my gosh, because we recently had someone that saw Willie at a rodeo that has, I mean, he's offered us three times what we paid for him. Just. Hopefully he's not listening. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, right. Um but he's, he's offered us three times what we paid for him, and it's really hard not to take that because of the investment of – the horses, to me, are just different than, yeah, than the dogs. Yeah, yeah, I do care mm-hmm. about them, but at the same side, like – It's a it, different – It just yeah. is different, right? Uh-huh. But if I – you know, or if we sell Willie, <laughs> there's going to be a devastated little boy. and yeah, You better have a backup plan. I know. Instantly. And that, that's, that's the problem is, you know – the, the biggest issue I have right now is most roping horses are fire-breathing dragons, and Willie can go from 100 miles an hour doing what I need him to do to put our two-year-old son on him and pony around like he's, yeah, uh, uh, he's uh, a horse in British lab form. Yeah, he's, he's fantastic. Like, literally, so, on and off switch. I, 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 it's hard. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. Okay, well, we've spiraled. Yes, we have spiraled, <laughs> for sure. But I guess where I was going with that was that it's I, we understand what you're saying, but yeah. that's why it's different for us. Exactly, yep. Right? Okay, that was great. Okay, so let's find another one here for uh, Whitney. Um, I'm going to go with um, how many sires and dams are yours? Mm -hmm. How many times do we breed the dams? Now, we kind of answered a little bit of that Yeah, we did a little bit. Um, Okay, so I own Purdy. She's now retired. Um, I have a couple more females that I've imported that will be, you know, having go to forever homes once they're done with the breeding program. But typically on site here, we have one for sure, one dam, maybe two. Um, but we really focus on the sires. Hang on. Let me look at this question again. Um, and then how many sires do we have right now? We have seven. Brock, Clyde, Bud. Uh, Bracken, Solo, Who Strike and Strike. Tucker. Well, t- well Tucker, Tucker is in limbo. So here's why he's <laughs> in limbo. Um, he he hasn't made the team yet, but oh my gosh, the, we've the fallen dude, hard for him. The dude is damn good. Yeah, like, he is really freaking good in the field and in the house. He I is. was so pleasantly he is surprised. So good. 
We love and him. And I, I actually <laughs> just showed him to, um, I just showed him to clients for the first time here a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh my gosh, like he's beautiful. He's fantastic. He's, um, so the reason that, that I wasn't like gung ho on him right away. And quite frankly, I wasn't going to keep him was because he is out of Brock's full sister. Yeah. He's Brock's nephew. Right. So Brock's nephew. Easy. Right. Um, and so I was like, well, I'm, I'm, I'll take him, finish his training and sell him as a finished dog. But this dog, I mean, he's the real deal. Like, I I hesitate to say he's the next Brock because you just don't get a Brock often at all. Mm -hmm. Like one in a lifetime kind of thing. But man, like, and what's so cool about it for me is that it's like I'm training Brock all over again. Mm -hmm. The mannerisms, how he responds to things, his strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so like, I feel like I'm fast tracking him (laughs) because I know what he's thinking. Like, yeah, I didn't with Brock. Brock taught me. I taught him. Right. We went through it. Like, I'm, I know what he's thinking. And, uh, like it he was, is so good. He's so good. What's what's really this is the first dog that I think Josh and I have both drooled over because we we love our dogs for two totally different reasons. Josh is always like, I want the fire breathing dragon. I love to go and train them. I want them to push on me. And I'm like, I want them to be the most gentle soul in the world in the house. You mm-hmm. know, and so it's like they all have their strengths and weaknesses on both sides, but Tucker literally has it so even for what Josh wants and what I want. Mm-hmm. And is there that has never ever ever happened before. Right. So right. it's cool to hear both of us be like, Oh my gosh, he's so amazing. Right, right. Yeah, it, it's funny because if you went down if you went down the list of of uh <laughs> of our sire let's do that because it's kinda interesting. Okay? <laughs> okay. I'll go down the list of sires and you tell you tell you tell me. Yeah. Like if you were to lean one Who way. Who Josh or Whitney? Yeah, if okay. it's you know, more your dog or more yeah. your more okay. my dog. Okay. Okay. Brock? Josh. Hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, Clyde. Josh. Yes. But, but just a little bit more. Clyde yeah. is good, but he's, yeah, yeah, he's a power. Right. Uh, Bud. Oh, I love him, buddy boy. <laughs> but that's a close one too, because I love him when I'm working, but he is, he's, he's definitely just more a of a special place in my heart. Yeah. He, he's more, he, he definitely grab it. He gravitates to you too. Yeah. Uh, Bracken. Me. For sure. Um, Solo. Josh. Yeah, that was, that was oh going to be. Oh my goodness, yeah. Josh. He is solo is just another powerhouse. Yeah. And and solo pushes on me, which I really, really yeah. like. Um, but I know it can be frustrating oh, sometimes. Good lord. Yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, Tucker. But one hundred percent fifty fifty. Okay. Um, which is so funny because I think he's like a hundred percent me, but um, <laughs> um uh strike. Fifty fifty. Yeah, I'd say so too. Don't you think so? I mean, he's just so like, oh, he's so sweet. He's got the sweetest eyes in the world, sweetest personality. Yeah, he does. Which and it's interesting because I would totally expect him to be a Whitney dog, because his hunting, everything hunting with him is nothing that you thrive on. I know. When you look, well, what 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 you mean by that is, when you look at him in the house, you'd be like, will this guy even go? get a retrieve like he just like right he's so chill and so calm mm-hmm. but you put him in that environment and he's a different dog in that moment but he can yeah. immediately shut it off immediately but he's also like okay brock is like i'm going to get the thing 100 miles an hour mm-hmm. strike is methodical he's, he's a different speed for sure yeah which you know like you look at the others like solo brock clyde they are zero <laughs> to 100 go yeah. He is not. Yeah. Well, so I was actually just talking with one of our uh, clients that yeah, he runs field trials. So here, here's a puppy that um, his dog, he said he is he is one pass away. And he is going to be a master hunter, hunter retriever champion before he's 18 months old. Amazing. But yeah, he's, he's doing freaking fun. And he, and he has a jam, too, so he's been running trials. Like, this mm-hmm. dog, like, He's a pretty quiet puppy. He's a pretty quiet puppy, yeah. like freaking A, right? But <laughs> he uh, he has a, a, a buddy that wants a puppy, so we're talking about all this stuff. And, um, you know, he's like, all right. And his que- one of his questions to me is like, all right, you you have a mega blind. And you got to pull one mm-hmm. dog out of the trailer. You know, who you bringing? I'm like, well, it's Brock. Mm-hmm. But I'll tell you what. I was like, strikes right there. Mm-hmm. Like, he really is. And he's going to do it at a different speed. Yep. Brock's 100 miles an hour, mm-hmm. strikes going 75, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. the thing is, for the vast majority of people, if you're if you're driving Brock, the race car, yeah, like if you're not on your game, if you miss a cue, if mm-hmm. you, like that's a train wreck because mm-hmm. he's going to get out of pocket really, really fast. Like strike is more forgiving in that way. Mm-hmm. The most forgiving dog that we have is Bracken. 
Totally. He is the root. So of all of my dogs that, and for as many tests as we've run, Bracken is the only dog that I have. And quite frankly, the only dog that I have ever owned that has never in his life failed a hunt test. Not once. Mm -hmm. Not one test. What a special boy. But it's because the speed he goes at is very forgiving. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know, the handler is a big play in this too. Right. So if, if there's like a big suction area or if there is, um, if I'm not quite on my game that day as a handler or whatever it is, like you take Brock, you take Clyde, like those dogs, they are out of pocket. Solo is going to be another one of them, right? They're yeah, out of yeah, pocket yeah. and, and you, they look not nearly as clean, which where we could get so a marginal knockdown, which means, you know, we couldn't get a pass if we have you know, two of those, right? Where for Bracken, he mm-hmm. goes and does all the work. He does it really, really well, but he does it at a pace that is super, super forgiving. And he is not a push on you, dog. No. Brock's going to push on me. Yeah. Clyde's going to push on me. Solo's really going to push <laughs> on me. Right? Like, those dogs are going to push on me, which I really like because I can push them back and we can go excel and break through a ceiling and go do big things. Mm-hmm. Like, Bracken, naturally, like, I haven't been able to push him as hard as the other dogs and mm-hmm. get them to do the elite things that the other dogs have, are doing, quite frankly. Because of that, right? But different temperament. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I'm going to do one follow up comment to Tucker because we've raved about him. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually, I've never told you this, but I'm so nervous to breed him actually, like to bring him into the breeding program. Really? Because, like, we love him so much that we still, like, even though you love a dog, even though he is literally perfect in your world, perfect in my world, we don't know what his offsprings are going to be like. Yeah. And, like, it would be a little sad if like if they didn't cut it for what we wanted. Yeah, and and that's that's where this is a business. And this is the difference between doing this as a hobby mm-hmm. and doing this as a business is that we are investing mm-hmm. time and money and sometimes you have to walk away, count your losses and take a hit, yep. right? And we've done this in the past mm-hmm. where we have two, three litters out of a dog and it just is not like just because you're a great dog does not mean you produce great offspring. Yep. Same thing in the horse world, right? Race horses right. all the time, right? Why, why isn't the secretariat's offspring ruining every single race that ever goes up, right? Mm-hmm. Um, not saying that I don't know anything about secretariat's <laughs> offspring, so don't quote me on that. But um, there's a that that's a thing, yeah. right? So where Whitney says you get scared. Yeah. Because if his puppies don't pan out, then what? Then he goes to a forever home. That's right. And that is a that would be a heartbreaking situation. And it always is. Yeah. It always is. Yeah. But it, it would really be for him, I think, especially because you know Brock has a super soft spot in my heart. Mm-hmm. And the reality is, he's getting older. What is he eight now? Yeah. I mean, oh eight my gosh, old. I can't believe he's eight. I can't I believe Clyde's nine. I know. So, um, all right, let's do uh, let's okay. do another one. Okay. 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 Let's see. Okay, this is a really good one for both of us. Okay. Um, we may look at it two different ways, but I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Your thoughts on puppy socialization. Everyone has their opinions, but what do you two do? Mm-hmm. Well, we don't, we just don't own puppies. So we don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So yeah, that's why we're going to think about it in two different ways. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to think about it as newborn to seven weeks. You can think about it however you want. Mm-hmm. My job to socialize these puppies is to set them up for success going home. What that means is they need to understand how to have their nails clipped. They need to understand having someone holding them, having someone touch them, like sacking out the puppy. They need to understand that. They hear vacuum cleaners. They hear the blender going when I make mush. They hear me doing dishes. They hear me talking. They hear a radio. They hear they're they're socialized to different environments. They move from one puppy nursery to another puppy nursery. They're walking on vinyl. They're walking on concrete. They're walking on gravel. They're playing in the hose in the summer. They're, um, they're learning how to go instantly outside and go piddle on the grass. Like my socializing and my puppies is to set them up for success, which is why I think I send home extremely confident puppies and have a very easy transition. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, people get so caught up in, well, have they have been around a wing yet? And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're seven weeks old. They're just babies. Mm -hmm. But that's my job. And that's the way that when someone asks me about socializing, that's exactly what I think is they need to be socialized to everyday normal activities. Something as simple as opening up a garbage bag. It You know, you hear about some puppies like, oh my gosh, I opened up the garbage bag and the puppy flinched. It's because they have not been 
they don't know what that is. Like you open it up and now it's this big thing flailing in the air to open it up. You know, what's funny about this question. It, yeah. I'm sorry. Were you done? Uh, <laughs> I am done. Okay, I didn't want to be in. <laughs> um, so what's interesting about this question is uh, Carlos Flores yep. mm-hmm. uh, asked this question. Carlos, did I tell you about the photo he sent me the other day? No. Okay, so I think it was last weekend. He sent me a photo of, uh, it was a selfie of him and Rick Smith. Oh, together. yeah, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, and Rick is a great mentor of mine. He's He's been an incredible um, person to look up to and mm-hmm. just kind of follow in a, in a footstep kind of way. He's just been a fantastic person in our life. Yeah. Um, and so it was funny because when, when I hear you talk about that stuff, Rick said something you know, like to us a mm-hmm. long time ago. This was before we even breeding. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had mentioned that that he can't stand when puppy nurseries are like this super quiet and like all this like classical music playing <laughs> and like so like white gloves, like let's not mm-hmm, let's not touch mm-hmm. the your puppies in the wrong way kind of thing. Because he's like, why do you think dogs have gun shyness issues when they go home? Mm-hmm. because they've grown up their whole life with everything so quiet and so peaceful. And so like mm-hmm. if they grow up in an environment, he goes, he goes, bang the pans, yeah. wash the dishes, you know, let them be around the noises as they're mm-hmm. growing up. Because then if it's just a part of life, they're, they're way less apt to have issues with those situations going yeah. home. And that's a lot of what you're talking about there with yeah. the blender and everything else, you know, going on. It's let's desensitize them to noise early on before they even know they're being desensitized to it. Right. Yeah, it's just a part exactly. of life. Exactly. Yep. Um, you know, and, and I guess the only part that I'll add to that is the biggest thing, drop my phone. <laughs> the biggest thing that, um, that I see with people when they go home is they just gamble too much. Right. And so when I say gamble, I've always said that I don't want to flip a coin and say, hey, let's see how this plays out. I want to put in the work and ensure that it does work out the way that I want it to, right? So don't bring this puppy to a dog park to see how it interacts with other dogs. Mm -hmm. Some of you might be like, who actually does that? Way too many people (laughs) is the answer. Like, what is going on? Like, like, okay, game fair. Why anyone would bring a puppy to game fair is absolutely beyond me. Like you have, everybody has their dogs. None of these dogs are under control and you have no idea. This little eight week old puppy is trying to figure out what the world is all about. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it has a hundred pound Chesapeake snap in its face and, and like, well, okay, now what? Mm -hmm. Right. Bring it to a distillery coffee shop. Yeah. For (laughs) for people socialization for sure. But I'm, I'm specifically talking dogs. Like go go with like. Go to your brother's house so you yeah. know he has a super soft, sweet dog. And maybe you, know, you take him on a walk together and he can just like the puppy. Mm-hmm. Like make sure you put the odds in your favor. Like don't, oh, let's see how this works. Because if it works the wrong way, mm-hmm. like this is what I think people need to just come to the realization on. Is that if you if you screw up badly, mm-hmm. you shoot a 12 gauge or I'm sorry, let's go 4th of July, right? Oh, God. Neighbor shoots yeah. a firework off. And you call me panicked. And, I, and guys, I, I, I would be willing to bet the over-under is an over on 50 phone calls the week after 4th of July that this exact thing happened. Neighbor shot a firework off. The puppy was outside. didn't know what was going on. Now he's flinching on all these, these noises like, I, I need to fix this. Like, you, that's not an easy thing. You don't just fix that, right? And the best way of doing it, of you know, putting the dog in a situation to succeed is not putting the dog in the situation, right? So I just talked to somebody the other day that was doing the same thing. It's like, I've heard you talk about that. I'm wondering, you know, what I do because you know, we go up to my wife's, you know, uh, lake house or my wife's family lake house on 4th of July. There's always fireworks around. I'm just nervous because, like, the dog can't be in the house all the time, right? I think the puppy was, like, 10 weeks old or mm-hmm. something like that. Um, but, you know, he's got to go outside. I'm just trying to figure out how to do Like, don't go. Like, that's the only advice that I can give you that you completely eliminate the situation of possibly happening. I get that it's a sacrifice. I get that it's not as fun. I do. I really do. But if you go up there and if you call me that next week, you're like, oh, it happened. I did everything I could to avoid it. I can't wave a magic wand and bippity boppity boo make it go away. Your 11 years of hunting seasons have now disappeared. That's right. Potentially, for sure. You know, yeah. And, and that's <clears throat> that's where... Ju- it's just not worth the gamble, mm-hmm. right? I mean, so 
take your time and ease into that. Yeah. So um, that's, uh, that brings me to the question I was, um, were you done with that one? Yep, I'm done. Well, there was one in here that I actually really liked, and i got to find it again. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to ask this question a little more like to myself, I guess, because it's a train question. <laughs> okay. But um, how do you like to evaluate and determine if a dog is ready for the next step in training and or testing? Okay. Mm-hmm. So these are two very different things for me. So for testing, I want the dog running and training at the next level of what I put them in for. Okay. So if I am training for a season level test where I'm running blinds, I'm working on casting, then I'm running started. Once I feel like I'm running finish level stuff, then I'm running seasoned. Right. And then once I feel like I'm very, very proficient at everything unfinished, then I'll, I'll put them into finished. And the reason being is that there can be so many bad habits that get picked up at tests that I want to be sure that I'm ahead of it and training to eliminate the habit before it comes up. Um, great one would be uh, just getting getting uh, jacked up going to the line and the dogs just just geeking out. Right. Well, you can't make a correction at a test. And if you run too many tests and give them too many opportunities to to have an issue with that, you're going to have an issue with it. And it's going to be very, very difficult to break. But if you do all the training and eliminate that behavior before you put them in the situation, you don't have the issue, right? Um, from a training standpoint, it's probably the number one question that we get when it comes to uh, the training process. Okay, so how do, you, how do you know when it's time to move on, right? And... The reality is that that is going to be a you answer. Because if I said, well, it will be you answer to an extent. I'll I'll explain it here. If if I told you when the dog has it down, you move on. Well, that means anyone with an eight-week-old puppy that's doing treat training, the third time that they say sit and the puppy sits down, they're going to be like, oh, my gosh, he's got it. Let's move on. Right? So that's not it. Right? Once the dog has it, you have to give them enough repetition to where they are getting or they're doing what you're asking them to do almost every time. Like they have to have it done really well and then you move on. But if you wait for perfection, you may never actually convince yourself to move on Mm -hmm. because no dog is going to be perfect. Okay. I have a theory of the full moon. I oh, just yeah. talked about this in the community. Okay? Yeah. In the when I say the community, the uh, retrieve roadmap community. So I posted a question right around full moon time, like, "Hey, just out of curiosity, did has anyone seen any goofiness out of their dog? Every I think I worded it like everything from what in the world or like you're a little off to like WTF is going on, <laughs> you know, like that spectrum. Because in the kennel, we certainly saw it that last week, Thursday, Friday. So we had the uh, the full moon was on a Sunday. We had Thursday, Friday, some dogs, and we're, and we're like, what in the world? Like, this is, like, regress majorly. Like, what is going on? Okay? Mm-hmm. Then Monday, they're back to totally normal. And then we had some dogs that it was after the full moon, like Monday, Tuesday. It's mm. like, what the heck is going on? Right? Um, many people in that community were like, I went and ran a hunt test, and it was like my dog's brain was gone. Yeah. Right? I won't even enter a hunt test on a full moon weekend because I feel like it's too much of a gamble <laughs> throwing money away. And um, so it is, it is. A, it, I'm telling you, if you're a big game hunter, you believe in moon faces. If you're a musky fisherman, fisherman. Musk, yeah. But if you're a fisherman, musky fisherman for yeah. sure, you believe in moon faces. If you're a law enforcement officer, I was going to say, you the believe crazies in moon faces, come out. Right? <laughs> if you are in retail, you believe in moon faces. You see all the crazies. Why would it not affect our dogs? Totally. I've had people laugh at me when I, when I say that. It is oh a real gosh. thing. I'm telling you. It's so now, real. Now, I will also say there were a number of dogs in the kennel that were not affected by it. So you may not see it in your situation. But if you did see it or if you had seen it, yeah. I think it's a real thing. So um, I would agree. Go ahead. What's your next one? Okay. I have. So these two kind of go together. Actually, so I'm going to ask both of them. Okay. Okay. Taking a young dog. Oh, wait. Hang on. No. Um, most common mistakes people make when bringing home a new puppy Training in mid stage after the first few months at home, but before they're a real dog. So do you see how those two kind of go together? Well, they're not a fake dog before they're an adult. <laughs> <laughs> a big dog. Big dog. Uh, um, so the the question's more about um, what to do between bringing them home and then yeah, between like, when you're doing real formal I stuff. I would say right? le- in our, let's think, seven weeks to five months. Okay. So a few things. The, the big thing I always say is let the puppy be a puppy. Yeah. Okay. And I think this is very, very important because oh, we just had somebody drop a puppy off the other day. 
that is four months old. And the guy came in and he's like, uh, and the four months old is before we normally do, but we made an exception because they were on a vacation and we could make it work. He's mm-hmm. like, I mean, I've got a training question. I just am kind of struggling through. So I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He's like, the dog's really struggling with hand signals. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what? What? He's like, yeah, just like, he's just not getting it down. Like sometimes he does and sometimes I'm like, he's four months old, man. Like four months, right? And so this is where your expectations come into play. Mm-hmm. You need to have the right expectations. This is where if you're a Retriever Roadmap member, you know this because the first module is train the trainer. I talk so much about how you should be proceeding through this from your mental side because how you handle it as the coach is oftentimes what dictates success or failure. So when when we're looking at that development, so I say a lot of times, let the puppy be a puppy because you can't get that time back, right? You want them to play, you want them to develop, you want them to have that time. But that doesn't mean we don't do anything. Mm-hmm. So we're treat training, we're introducing those those commands, the mm-hmm. basic commands, sit, come, place, yeah. good stuff. Um, we are crate training or kennel training. Yeah. Some people call it kennel, some people call it crate. Very, very important because that is going to be a tool for the rest of the dog's life. I don't care if you're like, I let my dog you know, ride in the back seat, or I, I, don't, I let my dog roam the house. That's fine, but there's going to be a time and place that you are going to need a crate, need mm-hmm. a kennel. And if your dog is not desensitized to that, they're going to work themselves up. They're going to be stressed out. They're going to be completely like foaming yeah. at the mouth, goofiness, right? And puppies love crates. It's yeah. a very small, confined, um, safe place for them. Mm-hmm. They love it. Yeah. Um, you can do some basic retrieves. Yeah. I, I, to oh, me, that, that's like last priority. I but. have an analogy. You are a big analogy person, and I have come up with my own on retrieves, uh-huh. and I've never told you this. Okay, but I'm it's, interested. I've loved seeing my clients be like, aha. <laughs> okay, so. Well, let's hear it. You know, because I give, like, my little puppy boxes, and in my puppy box, there's a little puppy bumper. Mm-hmm. Everyone's so excited to throw this puppy bumper, and I'm like, you only throw it two, maybe three times, and you're done. Like, if that's what you want to do at a young age. And there's a lot of people that are like, but why? Like, if they're so excited, why not keep going? And I say, well, here's the deal. Say, I give you a bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. You eat that entire bag of Reese's peanut butter cups. You're not going to want another one. Look at you. And wait, I'm not done. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you eat the whole bag. You're, you're going to be sick of it. You're not going to want another one until, I don't know, a month from now, whatever. But if I give you a Reese's peanut butter cup, one every day. Every single day, you are going to be excited to get that one Reese's peanut butter cup, and it's going to continue to build on that excitement. It's the same thing with the bumper. That's a, that's a that's a very good analogy. Thank you. That's great. Finally, on my own, I'm that's so great. proud of myself. That's good. No, I'm okay. proud of you too. That's great. Yep. Um, do you have anything to add to that one? No, just keep it simple. Focus on socializing, like what we said. Socializing is a is a. I think socializing and crate training are the two biggest, most important things for mm-hmm. a puppy. So, um, totally agree. Um, so we need, we have one more, um, that we should go over Well, you got to go. So let's have, let's do one more that you are going to do. And, um, and then I can maybe take a couple, we have so many of these. I'd I'd like to hit as many of these as as I can. And I have Mm -hmm. a few more minutes that I can stick around before I have to get back for my appointment. Um, so why don't you go ahead and pick one more here that, uh, that we can do. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to, I just have one really quick one. Okay. I'm going to end on my quick one. We'll, we'll do the longer one first. Okay. 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 Um, what's your number one piece of advice to new business owners? Mm. You answer it and then I'll answer it or I can answer it and then you answer it. Yeah. You answer that. That's a good one. Okay. I would say, um, take the risk, but prepare yourself for the fail and learn from the fail. Like you have to take the risk, right? Mm-hmm. Like to get further, but have a plan in case you fail and learn from it. My thing is that I'm always like, if I feel like I failed in something, I've, instead of looking at it as a negative, I'm like, how can I do better? Mm-hmm. How can I learn, use it as a learning experience? Don't get down on yourself. Just learn from that fail. Yeah. And, and you know, that, that right there is a, uh, you guys are, are going to geek me out of my business side because now I'm like, I'm in a different mode. Um, but like what you said right there. So one, you know, with the, the way the question is worded, the assumption I'm making is that this person has already started a business, right? New business mm-hmm. owner. Um, man, like that's the first step. 
Yeah. Most people are too afraid to take that risk mm -hmm. because it's scary. Mm -hmm. It was, it was scary every time we've done something like that, right? Mm -hmm. It is scary. Um, and this is where I think, where I say, I think the school system fails us mm -hmm. is what you just said. Why is everyone afraid to fail? Because we have been told our whole life that failure means you're not good enough. Right. Right. You fail second grade. You're an idiot. <laughs> right yeah like it's just the, the way i'm sorry if anyone out there <laughs> failed second grade right but that's that's yeah. the thought yeah. right when you take a test there's only one right answer yeah bs there is mm -hmm. there's not just one right answer yeah right and so like when when we're running a business the to me the the understanding that things are not going to go perfect mm -hmm. it's going to be a bumpy road Mm -hmm. You need to take the failures and learn from them, mm -hmm. apply them, and then they become lessons. They're not failures. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the hardest thing to, to really understand. That's the, that was the hardest thing for me to understand because mm -hmm. I like, excuse me, I like everything to be perfect. I like everything to be buttoned up. I like everything to go the way I want it to. And it just never is. Mm -hmm. The other thing is you will never make everyone happy. Mm-hmm. That, that, that is a, an extremely difficult thing to grasp. The mm -hmm. whole, the customer is always right thing is not a correct statement, right? <laughs> like, you know, we, we bend over backwards mm -hmm. for people, but it's, it's not the truth. And the reality is that sometimes you just have to accept that you're not going to make everyone happy and move on. That's difficult for most business owners because you pour mm -hmm. your heart and soul into what you're doing it is your name it's your reputation you want everyone to be happy but i'm telling you there are times that you can do literally nothing more for someone bend over backwards do everything you possibly do and someone still doesn't think it's good enough yeah don't Especially change yourself for that person that's stay right. true to your roots that's right um well that was such a great one yeah i loved that that was good what was your next one i think you said so you had two before. I, yeah i have one more so josh is great at grilling he's a really good cook and there's, um, there's a question in here. Josh's recipe for puppy mush. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Go ahead and tell the story. <laughs> Go ahead and tell it. So Josh is like, a gr he's a great grillman. Is that what you call it? Grills master. I don't know what you grill would call man? it. I'm not really sure what you... Josh is great at grilling. He's great at cooking. And puppy oh, no, mush no, no. is like if, literally... If it's on the Blackstone or if it's on the grill, <clears throat> I can do an okay job. Okay. Um... But Puppy Mush, he has struggle bus 100%. So, so I had to have Josh make mush for me one time. I think I was like whelping all the litter. I couldn't get up to the other puppy nursery to make a mush. And um, and I asked him to go and do it. And literally, it's like three ingredients. I think like I, I had three ingredients. It's the kibble, milk replacer, and water. And literally, I said, put this much kibble in, put this much milk replacer, like, you know, make the mush. And he te he sends me a photo and it's like the chunkiest, like most disgusting thing I've ever seen. And he's like, why does this not look like yours? And I'm like, how do you not know to add water in? Like every because single thing. Because you didn't thing, have add water in the I'm instructions. Like, <laughs> I mean, I appreciate that you are such an instruction follower, which like Josh always preheats the oven. He always like reads instructions. So I should have known better. Yeah, because I'm He's not a, a type A. You're like, such a type A. It, it, Live it, on the edge a little. Oh, come oh on. My God. <laughs> Live on the edge a little. That's why our smoke alarm goes off because something's burning. Because, oh, yeah, I forgot about it. <laughs> so not me. That would be you know the what? other party in my our My puppies <clears throat> love my mush. They make me feel so good when I make that mush and they gobble it right down. But I was just like, how do you not know? you got to add a liquid in to blend something. But when, okay, so <laughs> let's, let's go back to the previous question. So uh, advice for, for business owners. When you are giving instructions to an employee, give the full instructions. Don't make yes. assumptions that they are just going to know what else to do. Yeah. Over communicate, whether they're your spouse, employee, whoever they are. Over communicate. There's nothing wrong with over communicating. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. Okay. All right, babe. Well, I, uh, I'm going to take a couple more of these. That sounds good. You I need, need to, to get go. Going. Yep. Okay, thank you for having me on. Your your thank new you. studio is beautiful. Whoever did the decor in here was top notch. <laughs> you can take a wild <laughs> guess who that was. Yep. All right. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yep. 
All right, guys. So that that was great. I always love having Whitney on because it just one it kind of breaks things up for me and kind of gives me a, a different uh, different level of of energy. I think just having someone else here, as you can probably imagine, it's not always easy talking to myself uh, all the time. But it's always just kind of she she always has such a fun energy that's great. So, um, but I do want to uh, I do want to go through a few more of these because there's so many and I I really want to hit as many of them as I can. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so I have one here. Let's see. Um, what to expect from a four-month-old American pointing lab? Uh, are my expectations too high? So I don't know what your expectations are, but if you're asking if your expectations are too high, I'm going to probably guess that they probably are. Um, so as a four-month-old, really, we aren't going to have many major expectations, right? We are going to be working through our obedience, the crate training, the socialization, Water introduction this time of year is a great thing. You know, that's something that we really should, you know, touch on real quick because if you have a puppy, this summertime is the best time to capture some water introduction because if you don't, especially if you're in the north, you're going to get into that uh, that winter where obviously you can't, and then it'll be basically 10 months from now before you can get the dog in the water. So take advantage of that. Do it the right way. Don't throw them in off the dock, right? Like ease into it. Let them do it, but take advantage of that time. Um, safely, make sure the blue-green algae and all that stuff. If you don't know what blue-green algae is, I'm not going to get into it now just because I'm limited on time. Look into that. It is very important that you keep your dogs safe, okay? So look into blue-green algae, especially if you're in one of the areas that they are known to be, that algae. Um but yeah, I would say if, if you're questioning if your expectations are too high, they probably are, um, but it's something to manage. This is where, I'm not trying to plug it here really, but if you if you go become a member of Retriever Roadmap, we talk about this. We really do. So if again, again, if anyone wants it, DD100, DD100 will give you that that code. But that is something that it's, it's very important for you to have the right expectations because if you're moving too fast, if you're pushing too hard, you can shut a dog down. You can overwhelm them, you can frustrate them, and you can shut them down, which is the last thing that we want to do. So going at the right speed is very important. Developing at the right pace is very important. So um, go into that. And then there's a, a kind of a segue into this. Uh, preparation for a young dog's first trip to NODAC. So if you have it, so I don't know what a young dog is in this exact situation, right? But um Let's just say that your dog is going in their first hunting season. Now, if you follow along with me, you understand and you know my thoughts on redshirting that first year and why that's important. Teach their own. Some people are going to listen to me. Some people go, yeah, I understand totally what you're saying, but I'm not going to do it. Totally get it, you know, but it's up to you. Um, I would be redshirting that first year. I'd be bringing them out. I'd sit them down, and I would just make them watch. Let them desensitize to everything you can't train for, right? But if you're going into this, this is now their first hunting season. Okay. Um, a couple things. So first off, if they've never traveled. So when I, when I hear, uh, first trip to Nodak, I assume that's the first hunting trip that they've ever been on. Make sure they're acclimated to the crate because that is going to be your best friend. Whether you're in a hotel, in a lodge, bounce around, you're out hunting. The dog is going to have to have a secure place to be in that keeps them safe. That keeps them under control and something that they are comfortable with. If you have not gone through your crate training, and all of a sudden you think you're going to shove your dog in a crate in a new place and like that dog is going to be so overwhelmed it's it's going to drive you nuts right what you need to do is you need to take the time now to prepare for that get them in that that crate get them super comfortable because what you're hoping for is you go into that hotel lodge whatever it is and the dog's going to be going oh my gosh new 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 people new area new house new ba 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 but when you put them in that kennel the idea is that they go oh, I know where I am. I know this is my comfy spot. Okay, I'm cool. And they just chill out, right? Um, from a hunting standpoint, I would be desensitizing them to everything you possibly can before you hit that field. So make them you know, train through decoys. Show them spinning wing decoys, assuming that it's, it's a duck hunt. Um, you know, Make sure that your gunshots or your gunfire is like it's not just one shot. You do some reports, assuming that it's, it's a group hunt. Um, if you're going to be hunting over water, make sure the dog has plenty of water work. If you're going to be hunting in fields, make sure, you know what I mean? Like the, the blind that you're going to be hunting out of, make the dog very, very, very comfortable training in and out of that blind. Anything you can prepare for, uh, will, that will make them successful. Do plenty of that before going out. The last thing you want to do is have a bunch of new things you're trying to show the dog 
on opening day when there is enough that you can't control the way it is. Control what you can control. It's very, very important. Um, let's see here. <laughs> uh, are you, are you, I'm assuming they're talking to Whitney. Are you going to harvest more than Josh this year? I promise you she would have had a very sarcastic answer to this. Um, well, the answer is probably yes. And the, here's why it's probably yes. I'm finding that I am shooting my gun less and less. I just like, I'm just in this period of my life where I'm there for the dogs. I love calling. I love watching birds work. I love the camaraderie being there with everybody. Don't get me wrong. I do love pulling the trigger, but it, uh, it's a little anticlimactic for me at this point. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I'll kind of, you know, ebb and flow in and out of this stage, but that's kind of where I'm at. So she probably will kill more than I will this year, um, at least bird-wise. So um, let's see here. What This is a really good one I don't have a great answer for, maybe. What is one piece of advice you would give yourself 10 years ago? My goodness. That's a really, that's a really good one. I think, I think when I look back on the last 10 years, one thing that's incredible to me is how much has changed. Okay, so I, I, you know, I look back now on where I was 10 years ago and where I am now. So much has changed in that time. Um, obviously become a father, um, have you know, a couple more businesses, but it, it's, it's, it, it's hard like now, okay, it's hard for me to picture that in the next 10 years. Forward looking is always scary. It, it's always intimidating. You have these goals, you have these aspirations. But one thing that I can tell you is what has helped me continue on my path and continue to knock off goals, become successful, continue to build is writing them down and taking time to reflect and build off of it. So I have a notebook that I have, I have your know, short term, midterm, long year goals, and I actively work towards them every month. I sit down with myself and I go over it every month and I check in with myself. Where are you at? What do you have to do to achieve this goal? I knock out a goal, I make another one. And I'm always forward looking that way. I do have a hard time looking 10 years down the road. But I think, you know, that that shorter term is more you know, more my wheelhouse as far as like actively focusing. But what's funny is that I'm a long-term thinker. I'm always playing the long game. I'm always like, I'm not, I'm not trying to do anything fast, anything quick. I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. And, uh, and that's what, that's kind of been a, an interesting, an interesting thing for me. I want to think about that one. Cause I, I'm sure I could have a way better answer if I actually sat and thought about that. One. That's a really good question. Um, Let's see, I'm going to do one more here because then I have to get going because I have my own uh, appointment that I have to get to. Um, let's see here. Taking a young dog from junior hunt test to started hunt test. Okay, so, you know, at, at that first junior, so I'm, I'm going to just generally speak here. Junior and starter levels, it really, it's for the handler more than the dog. Right, the for the g most generally speaking, um, the tests are going to be very easy. They're going to be straightforward. It is for the dog to be successful, and is to get the handler involved. What I would be talking more is senior and seasoned. And what I would be telling you is that when you're at these tests, that's great. Go accomplish what you need to accomplish on your run, and then immediately get to that next level. Pull up a chair and watch. Bring a notebook. Take notes. Take notes on what your dog is going to need to do. Take notes on the certain situations that you are seeing judges are setting up, what the dogs are doing, what dogs are struggling with, what you think you have to train with for your dog, because I promise you, you're not going to remember it all, especially if you're new to it, right? You're not going to remember it all. Um, one of the big ones that people miss on a, on a season test is a walk-up, right? So the dog's at heel, you're walking up to the line, bird comes out, boom, shot, but the dog is off lead, on heel. Like a lot of times when we practice, right, like the dog is sitting, we're sitting on a bucket, everything's going on. This is tempting to break. And they can't break, right? So, um, you know, little things like that that's easy to forget because it's a little abnormal than your normal routine. I would say really focus on that time, getting to that next level, taking notes and preparing for it. And I would not be entering that next level like I had mentioned earlier 
until I feel like I'm training for the next. If I'm training for master, if I'm training for finish, then I'm running senior and season. That's my philosophy on how I like to do that. So, um, anyway, hope uh, hope you guys. Oh, let me let me go over this. Uh, Jacob Tanner, Jacob Tanner. If your ears just perked up because uh, I, I came over your speakers, Jacob Tanner, check your email because you won the Gun Dog Supply uh, episode 103. A giveaway from Gundog Supply where they gave a $103 shopping giveaway. So you want yourself $103 of whatever you want at Gundog Supply. Just make sure you check your email on that. So um, hope everyone has a fantastic weekend, fantastic rest of your day. Uh, go crush the week and go make sure that you are getting those reps in because I promise you it is going to be here before we know it. It's crazy. It's it's incredibly fast how a season is going to come up on us. and this Summer is just disappearing fast and what we know it so hope everyone has a fantastic rest of your day and we'll talk with you soon thanks for listening be sure to follow us on facebook and instagram leave us a review on itunes and a special thank you to yukanuba because without them we couldn't do what we do here bringing this information to you